let's review a little. Last time, we defined for a tensor the border rank of T, which is the smallest R such that the corresponding point in projective space lies in the rth secant variety of the Segre variety. So these are the rank 1 tensors, and this is its rth secant variety. And we saw classical equations. Let me write them slightly differently today. We think of T, we may think of it in many different ways. We may think of it as a linear map from the dual of A to B tensor C. Maybe I'll write TA here. And the rank, the border rank of T was at least the rank of the linear map TA. So in particular, if um, TA is injective, which we would expect it to be usually, then the border rank of T is greater than or equal to A, which is dimension of A. And we saw that if A, B, and C all have the same dimension, then we can go roughly up to the cube, uh, a squared over 3, sorry, for border rank. Any questions uh, regarding yesterday's lectures? OK. So notice this is equations for this variety in this space of tensors. And we obtain the equations by kind of making a retreat to linear algebra. So today, um, I'm going to talk about Strassen's equations. So these equations were around 1985. And as far as I know, they're the first interesting equations for secant varieties of Segre varieties. Their symmetric version and partially symmetric versions had been discovered a little earlier, the dating all the way back to Toplitz. So I'm going to do a, a special, see now if we look at this space, let's assume that this map is injective. So this is a linear subspace of B tensor C, C which is, this, for example, the set of linear maps from B, from, say, C dual to B. And we don't, so a space of linear maps, so in fact we could think of this space as a point in the Grossmannian of A planes inside B tensor C. Now, let me make a genericity hypothesis. Well, first we'll assume that dimension of B equals the dimension of C. If they're not equal, just take the smaller of the two numbers and restrict your tensor. And we'll, this is just a convenience. And then we'll make a genericity assumption
that there exists some element in a dual with T of alpha of full rank. <clears throat> so why do I want to do that? Because I don't know a whole lot about linear maps between two vector spaces, but if we have this, then we can use T of alpha. This is a linear map now from, uh, let's think of it as a linear map from the dual of C to B. And this is a linear isomorphism. So we could take its inverse. And then for all um, alpha prime in A, we could think of the linear map T alpha prime T alpha inverse as a linear map from the vector space B to itself. So using alpha, we may identify T of A star as a point in the Grossmannian of M planes inside the space of endomorphisms of B. Well, why did I want to do that? Because if, so we know our border rank, in fact, Let's, for the moment, let's assume all dimensions are the same. What is M? I, oh, yes. That, that's what I was about to say. So assume A equals B equals C, and let's just set that number equal to M. So we have an M-dimensional subspace of the space of endomorphisms of CM. Now if the border rank, well let's say if the rank of T is equal to M, say T is equal to some A1 tensor B1 tensor C1 plus AM tensor BM tensor CM, and we choose bases properly, that is, that identifies B1 and C1, then T of A star as a space of matrices will look like this. It'll just be the diagonal matrices. Now, of course, usually when someone hands you a tensor, they don't put it in a nice basis that makes it easy to see what the rank is. Oh, oh where these are, um, all these are linearly independent. So, on the other hand, so we see that um, if there exists alpha in A star such that the, the rank in the usual sense of T of alpha equals M and uh, Well, let, and R of T is M, then T is in the Zariski closure 
of the diagonalizable subspaces of and E, which we may think of as a subvariety of the Grossmannian. So this is a choice of alpha. But as long as it works for one choice of alpha, it'll work. So what I did I do, I took a standard tensor of rank M. I observed that it gives rise to a space of matrices that are diagonalizable after some choice of bases. And therefore, for border rank, I must be in the Zariski closure of the space of diagonalizable endomorphisms. So this is Strassen's uh, observation. How does this help us study the border rank of our tensor? Um, if we had a test to see if a space of matrices was simultaneously diagonalizable, we would have a test for border rank equal to m. It must be border rank at least m because we assumed that this map is injective before. So I'm having two assumptions here. So let me write this out. This and T A injective. Well, that takes one question we don't know how to answer and gives us a different question we don't know how to answer. But we do know a necessary condition for a space of matrices to be simultaneously diagonalizable. For example, if they're simultaneously diagonalizable, they have the same eigenvectors, right? Eigenspaces, more precisely. And in particular, they must commute, right? Two, just think of two matrices are simultaneously diagonalizable if and only if they commute. And this extends to a space of matrices. So in particular, T is in the subspace of abelian subspaces of endomorphisms of B. And we know equations for matrices to commute. So let me um, assume I choose bases such that T of alpha becomes the identity matrix. Then we see that this then rank border rank of T equals M implies that for all alpha 1 and alpha 2 in a dual, the commutator is 0. These are quadratic equations after our choice and normalization.
If we want to find polynomials on spaces of tensors, they don't really count because they're not defined on the entire ambient space. What we really should have really have that this T alpha T alpha 1 sorry T alpha 1 T alpha inverse T alpha 2 T alpha inverse that this commutator is equal to 0 but there's a problem if we want these to be polynomials they won't be defined at points where T of alpha is not invertible. What's the, what's the formula, what, what can we do about that? I mean, we have this condition that's a test. It's a test in coordinates. But if we want to do algebraic geometry, we want a little bit more out of life than a test in coordinates. We want uh, polynomials. We, re we want polynomials on this A tensor, B tensor, C. And what we have are sort of local polynomials. Only defined on a subset. Well, again, if I have a matrix X and I want an expression for X inverse, we can compute X inverse in terms of the entries of X, right? How do you find the entries of the matrix for X inverse? So it's a basic linear algebra question. So if X is a 2 by 2 matrix, what's X inverse? This is yeah, 1 over AD minus BC. And then some other things go here. What is it? D. A minus B minus C, something like that. And this is called the cofactor matrix. Let me call this delta X the cofactor matrix. And in general, X inverse is 1 over the determinant of X times this cofactor matrix, where the entries of delta x are the size, um, if this is m by m, size m minus 1 minors, or subdeterminants, of x, right? You remember that from linear algebra class? Now, the determinant, determinant of x equals 0, or not equal to 0 if it only if x is invertible. So the x inverse is only defined, is defined. If and only if determinant of x not equal to zero, but this cofactor matrix is always defined. Right? It may be zero, but it's still defined. And so what we'll do is 
So today uh, we only have two topics, Strassitz commutator and then we're almost at this kind of mixing the two topics. Uh, one small remark, uh, the Tensor book I wrote has a very extensive discussion of Strassen's equations, far more than I'm going to say. So what we should really work with here to have polynomials is um, if we look at T alpha 1, the cofactor matrix of T alpha, T alpha 2, cofactor matrix of T alpha, this commutator is defined for all alpha, alpha 1, alpha 2 in A star. And these give polynomials on A tensor, B tensor, C if the border rank of T is equal to or less than or equal to M even, then these polynomials are identically zero. Namely, so this is an M by M matrix. So these are a space of M squared polynomials for all for each choice of alpha, alpha 1 and alpha 2. So we could think of it as polynomials if I eat these things. So this is polynomials on B tensor C, but the choice of alpha, alpha 1, and alpha 2, if I erase those, it would look funny if I did, so I won't do that. That gives me polynomials on the full space. So the failure of T to be abelian, if T is not abelian, then the border rank of T is greater than M. If this space uh, now What can happen is that, let's say T were a generic tensor, then for alpha, alpha 1, and alpha 2, this subspace would be a generic subspace of the space of endomorphisms. And then not only would this commutator not be identically zero, but the failure but it would be full rank. So moreover, if T is generic, let me call this thing star, then for most alpha, alpha 1, and alpha 2, star will have rank maximum. So we expect that the rank of this commutator to um, measure the failure of the border rank of T to be M. And in fact, that's true. That the border rank of T is at least one half the rank of this commutator plus M. So
So I'll give a proof next, a uh, proof later. of this thing. But in particular, particular for T in CM tensor CM tensor CM, now have equations, some equations, for forward rank up to three halves m. So let's see what do these equations tell us about matrix multiplication. Well, remember this is, if I write it in coordinates, this is x, i, j, tensor y, j, k, tensor z, k, i. So I'm going to make a big matrix here. Um, let's do y1, 1, 1, y1, uh, n, Y two one Y two N two Y N one up to Y N N. So those will index the columns and the rows I want to index by Z one one up to Z N one Z one two up to Z N two all the way to Z one N up to Z N N. And if I want to look at this T A of M N, I'll get at this big matrix here. Well, what goes here? Here I have what goes with y11 and z11, x11, y11 and z21, oh, that's x12. Oh, OK, so it's going to be transposed because I wasn't smart. But anyway, uh, oops, no, this is xn1 because I screwed up, xnn. So I just get this xij here in this block, just looking at this formula here. Right? I has to match this index. And J matches this index, right? So that's what we see. And what goes in this block? Well, X11 or X, I need this upper index has to have X lower one. But then um, the index here is off because the y's and the z's, the lower y index, oh, did I miss? Ah! Yeah, no, the lower y index has to match, I made a mistake. Uh, the lower y index. The lower y index has to map th match the upper z index. So this one, these are all z upper. Oh, sorry about that. The lower y index has to match the upper z index. So the upper z index here should be 1. One's up here. Yeah. 
that then I need these lower y's to all be ones too if I want all the x's here. Because if these z's are all upper ones, these y's should be all lower ones. Yeah. Yes? Yes. So 1, 1, 1, n1. One. And now the x lower index is the y upper index. Yes. And the x lower index is the upper z index. What am I doing wrong? The x lower, the x upper index is the lower z index. That's right. The upper, x upper index is the z lower index. So this is 2, 1. Ah, so now it works out right. Right. And now here, I will have z2, 1 up to z2, n. But the y lower index has to match the z upper index, so I get 0 all the way down here, that here I get zero because they, they don't match, and then here I repeat. And again, I just get these xij's along the block diagonal and zeros elsewhere. Okay. So now we could take, for example, um, take alpha such that alpha of x i i is equal to one, and alpha of x i j equals 0, i not equal to j, to get the identity matrix. And then we could take arbitrary matrices in there. Will be arbitrary traceless, well, arbitrary matrices. And we just take the commutator of two such matrices and since these are block diagonal as long as n is greater than 1 the rank of this commutator will be full That's an n squared by n squared matrix. And you could see, because you could get a commutator that each of these blocks has non-zero determinant. So the full matrix has non-zero determinant under commutator. And we prove Strassen's theorem. That the border rank uh, matrix multiplication is at least 3 halves n squared. So classical, we had n squared. And now we've improved it to 3 halves by this relationship between, we don't know about this, but we do know how to test for this. So it's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. OK. Sorry, that was a little. Uh, Confusing with the matrix, got dyslexic. So, rather than give you the proof of Strassen's equations now, instead I'm going to. Uh, well, I could do two things. I can, let me give you a slightly, yeah, um, a geometric description uh, 
of the cofactor matrix. This involves a little bit of exterior algebra. If I have F, a linear map between two vector spaces, I have induced linear maps F wedge K from lambda KV to lambda K W. In fact, we also have F, say, tensor to the K from V tensor to the K to W tensor to the K. This would be V1 tensor, 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 VK maps to F of V1 tensor, 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 F of VK. And similarly here, little v1 wedge wedge little vk maps to f of v1 wedge wedge f of vk. If what's the relation? Between a matrix re representing F and one representing F wedge K. So this is a linear or, al or a multilinear algebra question. So this one, let's say V and W both have same dimension M. Well, it doesn't matter. So Let's, so we have this V by W matrix. And from it, we should get a V choose K by W choose K matrix. If we choose bases, what is that new matrix in terms of the old? How do I find the entries of my new matrix? You agree with me that this is a completely canonical construction given this to get to this. So there should be a recipe to go from this matrix to this matrix if we choose bases. Let's say F was a linear map of rank K minus 1. What would be the image of this map? Zero, because there would be no K linearly independent vectors in the image. How do we test if a matrix has rank K minus 1? Right. So if F has rank K minus 1, this new matrix is identically 0. If it, it has rank K or greater, this new matrix will not be identically 0. In fact, the entries here are the size K minors of the V by W matrix. In particular, if dimension V equals dimension W equals M, we can look at F wedge to the M minus 1.
And the entries of this are the size m minus 1 minors. of f i.e. f wedged to the m minus first power and bases the matrix is the cofactor matrix of the matrix for f. You have to worry a little bit about transpose, but I'm not going to worry about that. And in fact, we can make the entire discussion coordinate free by noticing that the dimension of lambda m minus 1v is m choose m minus 1, which is m. And if we fix some element of lambda m, I don't know whether I want v or v dual. That's OK. We have a perfect pairing this is a one-dimensional vector space, that we can identify lambda m minus 1 v with v dual. So f wedge to the m minus 1, and you'll see the transpose in a moment, we could think of as a map from v dual to w dual. And so if we take the transpose map, so in general, if f is a map from a to b, L transpose is a linear map from the dual space of B to the dual space of A. That is, L is in A star tensor B, which is, on the one hand, linear maps from A to B, but it's also linear maps B star to A star. And we traditionally write transpose, because in matrices it is the transpose. This is a map from W to V, and this is the inverse uh, times the determinant. So this is our cofactor in invariant language. So the determinant represents the choice of this omega, this choice of volume form. So although I described this construction of Strassen originally in coordinates, one can make it entirely coordinate free using this language. I go too fast again. Now, we saw implicitly if there does not exist alpha in a dual with the rank of T alpha maximal, Strassen's equations are no good. Not robust in the sense that they'll tend to vanish identically.
Now, it could very well happen that there is a tensor of high border rank that does not have this property, but we, we won't deal with that today. So now let's ask the question, assume, say that T is um, concise, i.e., uh, which is by definition, T is not contained in some A tensor B prime tensor C or A prime tensor B tensor C or A tensor B tensor C prime for A prime proper subset of A, B prime subset of B, C prime proper subset of C. That's concise. And we'll assume that there exists alpha and A dual with T of alpha maximal rank. So let's call that 1A generic. And in the rest of this lecture and probably part of the next lecture, I'll ask the following question. Under these genericity assumptions, how good are Strawson's equations more precisely say there exists alpha say alpha say T of alpha is a full rank and all these commutators are identically zero for all alpha 1, alpha 2, and A dual, can we conclude that the border rank of T is equal to M? So T here is in CM tensor CM. That's the question I would like to address. So let's review what we have done so far. We, last time, we found equations just by making a naive retreat to linear algebra. Now we found more sophisticated equations by making a more sophisticated retreat to linear algebra by looking at the family of linear maps. Or let me, let me actually do a little aside before addressing that question, just review. So last time, studied this T from A dual to B tensor C. If good, i.e. injective, can consider the nature of the image and we found that if the image is pathological or if the image is not pathological in a certain sense get lower bound on the border rank of T. And this is some general mathematical principle you think of like secondary characteristic classes. 
if your first obstruction vanishes, you should look at the zero set and try and find a second obstruction. And so this is kind of what we did here. First thing was good, and then we look for more refined information once the first thing works from the image of this map. You should be doing this all the time in mathematics in very general context. And now we have these equations. And we ask ourselves, how good are these equations? Questions? So let's just fix some notation. So now I'm going to be studying spaces of endomorphisms. So let's fix some alpha 0 in a dual with t alpha 0 of full rank. And let E alpha 0 comma t be defined to be the space of linear maps. So this is a linear subspace of the space of endomorphisms of B. Or um, E alpha 0 T is a point in the Grossmannian of M planes in the space of endomorphisms of B. Either way to think of it. And Strassen says that R of t equals m implies that E 0 of t is abelian subspace. All the elements commute. Now, as mathematicians, we should be a little uh, bothered by our choices. I don't like to make arbitrary choices when I do mathematics. I want to know uh, how things depend on a choice that I make. So this following lemma is reassuring. If this E alpha 0 of t is abelian, then in fact, E alpha 1 of t is abelian for all alpha, or let me call it alpha 0 prime, for all alpha 0 prime with the rank of t of alpha 0 prime equals m. So that is to say, although we made a choice, our choice does not matter. Because I don't like to make choices, and if I have to make a choice, like I had to here, I want to know that the answer will be independent of my choice. I mean, there's a geometric choice of choosing only things, only vectors where this is invertible, but I don't want a non-geometric choice to have be relevant. So let's prove this. So this is preliminary to our actual study. So um, we have that E alpha 0 of t abelian says that t alpha 0 uh, t alpha 1 t alpha 0 inverse t 
alpha 2, t alpha 0 inverse equals t alpha 2, t alpha 0 inverse, t alpha 1, t alpha 0 inverse for all alpha 1, alpha 2 in a dual, that these two things commute. If I, I multiply this one and this one, it's the same as multiplying this one and this one. Right? That's what it means for those two to commute. Now, since T alpha zero is invertible, this is a full rank matrix, I could just erase this from both sides. And it's still a true statement. And we want to show that T alpha one, T alpha zero prime inverse T alpha 2 equals T alpha 2 T alpha 0 prime inverse T alpha 1. Now let's make a, for the moment, Assume that T alpha 1 and T alpha 2 are also invertible. Then I can use star implies that T alpha 0 could be written. Oh, right. I also have. T alpha 0 prime, T alpha 0 inverse, T alpha 2, or let me call it T alpha J, equals T alpha J, T alpha 0 inverse, T alpha 0 prime because this is abelian so I could use it with alpha 0 prime and alpha j and now I can write um, A slight typo in my notes. I wanted to write T alpha zero equals T zero prime inverse T alpha J T alpha zero inverse T alpha zero prime T alpha J inverse. So what did I do? I moved T alpha zero prime inverse. So I multiplied by that on this side. I multiplied by T alpha J inverse on that side. So this should be inverse here. And now if you take this expression for T alpha zero inverse and plug it in, uh, here and here, you'll get that. Because the um, alpha one inverse if I plug it in over here, we'll cancel the alpha 1. The alpha 2 inverse, if I plug in with j equals 2, we'll cancel the t alpha 2 here. The t alpha 0 inverse instead picks up this t alpha 0 prime inverse, which is what we want, and everything cancels. So I leave the rest to, um, so plug in 
to star uh, the left hand side with j equals 2 and the right hand side with j equals 1. And you get what we want. Okay, so we can make a choice and it won't matter. So that's good news. That's a preliminary result. And then um, if these are not invertible, they will still be limits of invertible elements. And so if something holds on a Zariski open subset, it holds on the full space. If equations hold on a Zariski open subset, they hold on the full space. All right. So we'll say if we'll say T now it makes sense to this definition makes sense. We'll say T is an A abelian subspace if E alpha zero T is abelian for some alpha zero in A dual. <laughs> and hence for all alpha zero in A dual with rank T alpha zero. So let's let's name this set. So Strawson's equations. So let's let's let um obel A is the set of um A abelian tensors. So I'm again using these genericity assumptions. So this is not an open subset of, this is not a, a closed subset of the set of tensors, but it is a closed subset of the set of tensors satisfying the genericity assumptions. And so what we have is, let me introduce another notation. Let's say diag A G, these will be the um, Zariski closure of the 1A one, one generic and abelian tensors. Sorry, so risky closure one a generic and diagonalizable intersect the one a generic and um, concise tensors, and what we have is that Abel a is some subset of diag G A T in diag G A implies that the border rank of T is equal to M and so the question over there rephrased is Abel A equal to Jag G A and if not how much smaller or how to detect membership 
in diag GA. So we always have containment. This we know. This we don't know yet. What is G in Naya A? Sorry? The superscript G Naya. The superscript G? Oh, because I'm intersecting with this Zariski open subset. So if, if so okay, so this is this is actually recent work. Um, and I'm lecturing on recent work with um, Mateusz Michalek, Michałek. And in our paper, we define several notions that I'm not going to define in this lecture. But I have this cumbersome notation here because it agrees with the notation of the paper. What is the meaning of G? G for generic. A generic yeah, but genera G for genericity assumption. But it's, it's, it's superfluous decoration for the purposes of this lecture. But if you're motivated to look at our paper, then uh, the notation will agree with the notation of our paper. So I uh, apologize for the cumbersomeness for the sake of consistency. OK, well, at least um, yes. Uh, I, I, I want to show you that these two things are not equal. And then I'll stop. And then I'll show you that they're really not equal this afternoon. So proposition t is one, if t is one generic concise, those are our genericity hypotheses, and the border rank of t equals m, then not only is this an abelian subspace, this is closed under composition. So before we saw that it was closed under taking brackets, I want to say it's closed under composition. And actually, I'm almost out of time, so I'll prove this this afternoon. But let me give it an example. So let's let m equal 5. And let me write t light, light for lightener. Well, let me write t lightener, but I won't write it. So 5. This will be a1 tensor, b1 tensor, c1 plus plus dot dot plus b5 tensor c5 plus a2 tensor. B1 tensor C3 plus B3 tensor C5 plus A3 tensor B1 tensor C4 plus A4 tensor B2 tensor C4 plus A5 tensor B2 tensor C5, i.e. T L5 of A star looks like this matrix, 5 by 5, x1, 0, x2, x3, 0, x1, 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 x1. Zeros are everywhere that I don't put something. x4, x5, x2. This is abelian, but not uh, closed under composition. So this is x, j, and c. So over here, in fact, we see that this is strict if m, in fact, greater than or equal to 5. Because 
You can write a tensor that satisfies Strassen's equations but does not satisfy the conditions of the proposition. Therefore, it cannot be a border rank M. I will prove the proposition this afternoon. And um, notice that this condition is very easy to check in terms of polynomials. You just need to check that, well, I'll write it out in terms of polynomials this afternoon. But we already see that even under these very uh, nice genericity hypotheses, Strassen's equations is not going to give us the answer. And so we'll continue this afternoon with the proof of the proposition. And then I'll describe further conditions uh, that restrict Strassen's equations. The stature of Strassen's equations diminishes their stature even more. Thanks for your attention.